Um, I, I just wanted to take a moment to anchor today's discussion, bringing about three important aspects about the, about the plastic crisis. Um, so firstly, um, as you ha would have seen in the movie, The Story of Plastic, um, we cannot think of plastic as only an ocean's problem anymore. It is a climate change issue. It is a social and an environmental justice issue. Every piece of plastic starts out as a fossil fuel and it emits greenhouse gases throughout its life cycle, from its extraction to production, as well as to disposal. And throughout this entire life cycle, the health and the well being of the communities that live next to the plastic facilities are impacted. The second point that I want to get across is that um, plastics is a potential health crisis. Today, we see plastic everywhere in our environment. Research is showing that it's in our food, in our water, as well as in our bodies. And that is because we are producing too much of this product. Nearly 40% of yearly plastic production is for items that we use once and throw away, single-use items. And the last thing that I'd like to say is that we cannot recycle our way out of this crisis. Uh, recycling plastic at a large scale is just economically not feasible. It never has been. So we need to turn off the tap on plastics. Last week at the UN Climate uh, Summit in Glasgow, what Vice President Al Gore explained that as the world is moving away from fossil fuels, and moving towards renewable energy of sources, the petrochemical industry is looking to replace that demand, the, the lost in demand from fossil fuels with making more plastics. And if that happens, if that planned expansion happens, it limits the world's ability to keep global temperature rise below 1.5 degrees Celsius. So we need to make a change, we need to demand for change, a systemic change. We need to ask our legislators, large corporations, the companies that we work for, the schools where our children go to, as well as in our homes. We need that change to come about. Today, our panelists will talk about solutions. There is hope. So they'll talk about solutions that are, that are available. And uh, we invite you to, put, uh, to have your questions posed to them in the chat. So with that, I'd like to invite our moderator, Jacqueline Wagner. Um, Jacqueline is um, the Director of Conservation Action from the Shed Aquarium, where her team mobilizes individuals, communities, and businesses to take action for animals through activities like restoring local lakes and rivers, opting for sustainably sourced seafood, and reducing their plastic waste. Take, away, take it away, Jacqueline. Thank you, Seema. Thanks for that introduction. I'm going to take a second to share my screen and kind of get queued up to share a couple slides. Um, Seema, can you see my screen? And just the, yes, yes, I can. Just mm -hmm. the slides. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so again, thank you for the introduction and for inviting inviting me to moderate today's discussion. I'm really grateful for opportunities like this where we can bring a lot of different types of people with different expertise into one place um, to connect with other members of our community who, who care about this issue, want to learn more, ask tough questions, and build a collective understanding in our communities about the plastic crisis so we can move toward a more sustainable future. And Seema, you did such a great job kind of rooting us in this current time that we are in and understanding how plastic is really, um, it's not just an ocean litter issue, even though that's really kind of what the uh, you know, public awareness has been for many years, um, but it is deeply entwined with climate change, public health challenges, local environmental hazards, and, and so on. Um, so hopefully many of you have had the chance to watch the story of plastic. If not, would definitely uh, recommend that you check it out after today's um, discussion to kind of go deeper on these topics. Um, the, the movie really helps to illustrate the interconnectedness of all of these issues and help to kind of raise our collective awareness. Um, so I'm going to kind of share 
just a little bit of information, kind of again, grounding us in this um, and our understanding of this issue. Uh, but the prevalence of plastic has really continued to increase exponentially, especially over the last few decades. Um, and this, this graph shows that the plastic production and waste continues to increase. Um, the solid lines are based on, um, on data that already exists and the dotted lines are showing projections for where we're heading by 2050. Um, the black line shows all of the plastic waste that's been generated. So that's like the, the top line. And then the blue is that bottom one um, showing uh, the, pl the plastic that has been recycled. Um, and in the Chicago area alone, as is similar as to much of the US, our plastic recycling rate is only around 9%. So we're not even close to keeping up with uh, the amount of plastic that we're producing. And I think that's going to be a common theme with a few of the folks speaking tonight that we're talking about, um, you know, the, the understanding that recycling is not our solution. Um, so we kind of need to get that out of, of our psyche, thinking that that's really what our answer is. It is part of the solution, but is, it is not the answer. Um, to also understand, you know, where we're situated, and we've kind of referenced a couple of times that Plastic in the ocean is, is um, you know, discussed quite a bit in, in the media, but plastic in our region is also a major concern. Um, and every year about 22 million pounds of plastic enter the Great Lakes. And I, and I made a note in the box there that the, the plastic that's entering the Great Lakes are both, it's pre-production and post-consumer. So pre-production means these little plastic pellets that um, a lot of times are transported via the Great Lakes or, um, or you know, used in the area around our region to produce plastic products. Those little plastic pellets called nurdles end up polluting the Great Lakes. Um, there are a number of studies to try to track where they are, how they're migrating around the Great Lakes and how they're impacting the environment. So that's kind of that pre-production. And then the post-consumer is kind of what we're more familiar with as litter, um, you know, after plastic bottles, bags, all sorts of things are used, they end up, um, you know, maybe in the landfill, but they all often are, are swept into, washed into the Great Lakes as kind of um, a magnet, unfortunately, for plastics being becoming concentrated. And um, one of our speakers today, Chelsea, is from the Friends of the Chicago River and will speak a little bit more about uh, the impact with rivers as sort of being a conduit of um, attracting plastic throughout our, our cities and our, our watershed, and then kind of sending the plastic into our Great Lakes. So we're kind of, um, you know, seeing how our freshwater asset here is, is impacted negatively by plastic. And I'm sure, you know, some of the uh, impacts of that, a lot of us are already aware. Animals consume um, plastic and can have all sorts of um, health hazards for them, but it also can end up in our drinking water. And um, I don't know the exact stats, but I think it was about 12 Great Lakes breweries uh, were tested a couple of years ago and all of them had remnants of plastic or microplastics found in them. So even processed beer is ending up with plastic. Um, we know that COVID has really amplified this problem. So just gonna wanted to reference that um, that's kind of where we are right now. It's really caused us to use um, much more plastic um, on, for PPE and, and restaurant carry out and things like that. Um, but it really has also helped to raise awareness and, and push a lot of us towards solutions as we're just taking note of the plastic that we're building up. Uh, we will talk quite a bit today about um, solutions, but I just wanted to give a snapshot of what Shed Aquarium's approach to tackling the plastic crisis looks like. Um, for many, many years, all we did was coastal cleanups, um, but we've really kind of built out a, a multifaceted approach um, to try to tackle the issue from multiple angles. So contributing to research, public education, um, working towards behavior change uh, for consumers and, and other community um, kind of influencers. We're working on po policy and advocacy, reducing our own plastic footprint and uh, working with the restaurant industry specifically on um, helping to get them away from um, plastics and their operations. So kind of just wanted to share that little snapshot so you kind of know who I am, what Shed Aquarium is doing, and uh, what our framing is for some of these things. Um, so with that, um, quick introduction, but wanted to you know not waste too much more time before we get to meet our panelists. Um, so I'm going to be introducing each panelist today. Uh, I will give them about five to 10 minutes to share some slides, share a little bit of their expertise. They all have such unique, different perspectives 
of the plastic crisis. But all of these things will be kind of connecting dots and seeing how they all fit together. So I'll introduce each panelist. They'll chat for a bit. Feel free to think up questions if you have anything that you'd like to ask them. Uh, they may be able to um, answer some of those in the chat as we move along, but we'll also be saving lots of time for uh, Q&A at the end of this um, event tonight. So I am going to um, stop sharing that screen and I'm going to actually introduce Eileen and then I'm gonna pull up your slides. So let me do... Um, couple things back to back here. So I'm excited to introduce Eileen Ryan. She is an activist who volunteers her time for climate and social justice causes in the greater Boston area. She helped to write and pass the single-use plastic ban in Watertown, Massachusetts, where she lives. And she grew up in North Bennington, Vermont, is a graduate of Bryn Mawr College, and is the parent of three grown children. She completed Judith Inc.'s plastic pollution course in March 2021. Eileen also gives architectural and historic walking tours of Boston with Boston by Foot. And that sounds really fun. I hope to get to visit Boston sooner than later. Um, check out one of your tours. So with that, Eileen, I'm going to um, share my screen so we can pull up your slides and, and hear more from you. Okay, well, I can start talking before you pull up the first slide. So that thank you great. so much for that introduction. And thank you, Seema, for pulling this whole event together. It's really great to hear what they're doing. you're doing at Shedd Aquarium. So I'm gonna specifically talk about the link between plastic production and climate change. So I'm honored to be here today. I saw this film, The Story of the Plastic, a year, exact, almost exactly a year ago, and it has transformed my life, actually. I took the course with Judith. I was already a plas anti-plastic activist, but I am even more involved now than I was before. So plastic production and pollution is an environmental, human health, and ecological disaster and a major contributor to climate change. From the extraction of fossil fuels and chemicals to create plastic to the transportation and refinement of these, what are called feedstocks, um, and ultimately to the disposal of plastic waste, plastics contribute to, to global warming. Plastic pollution is also, as Seema pointed out, a major environmental justice issue. 90% of the petrochemical plastic industry's pollution uh, occurs in just 18 communities in environmental justice neighborhoods in Louisiana and Texas, where low income communities of color live and are most affected with the dire health consequences of the plastic production industry. So you'll be hearing more about health consequences from another one of the panelists. And now Jacqueline, you can put up the first slide. Um, so we're going to talk now about how plastics are the new coal. So on October 21st of this year, Beyond Plastics, which is a great organization, I think there's going to be a link to it in the resources. Um, we, they just released this new report comparing the life cycle of plastics and the accompanying release of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere to the emissions from coal fired power plants. Much of the information I'm about to share with you is from this report and as are these slides are from that too. More than 130 plastic facil plastics facilities and related power plants report their emissions to the US Environmental Protection Agency, providing a baseline figure that at least 114 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent gases are released from plastic production facilities per year. So you can put up the second slide, Jacqueline. If plastic were a country, it would be the fifth largest greenhouse gas emissions contributor. When I learned this statistic this summer, I was shocked. The production of plastics is contributing more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere than the economies of China, the US, India, and Russia. Um, so, I mean, it's it, they follow those. I'm sorry, it is, I just got that in reverse order. So the emissions from plastic come just after those of China, the US, India, and Russia, and ahead of all other nations, which is pretty shocking. So slide three, which is plan B. So what's going on here? Why are we seeing this sharp rise in the production of plastic and the accompanying greenhouse gas emissions? The fossil fuel and chemical industries have seen the writing on the wall as communities around the world turn toward more energy efficient 
um, infrastructure and support renewable sources of energy. The fossil fuel industry is turning toward the production of plastic to maintain their profits. The petrochemical industry's plastic infrastructure is expanding and emissions are slated to increase dramatically. At least 42 plastic facilities have opened since 2019, are under construction or in the permitting process. If they become fully operational, these new plastics plants could release the equivalent emissions of another 27 coal-fired power plants by the year 2025. So that's coming up really soon. This is a very scary statistic. As the world closes coal-fired power plants, the plastic industry is quickly eliminating any benefit there is to these shutdowns. By 2030, the plastic industry's contribution to climate change will exceed that of coal. So next slide, Jacqueline. Most plastics are now made from fracked gas, which is extracted from shale. The amount of CO2 equivalent gases that are emitted from fracking each year is about the same as 18 average coal fired power plants, which is what you see in this slide here. Fracking made natural gas cheaper than it was ever before. And the US Energy Policy Act of 2005 gave oil and gas companies exemptions from environmental and health regulations. And with that boom in fracked gas um, that followed, a glut of raw materials for plastic production was created. When the US lifted its ban on crude oil exports, it set off a rush of oil, gas, and plastic feedstocks um, sales worldwide. Fracking also created a brand new petrochemical corridor along the upper Ohio River. As you might recall from the film, the young woman in Pennsylvania talks about how fracked gas from her neighborhood is being sent to Scotland just to produce plastic. So US land and water is now being polluted and you know, water sources are being destroyed to produce single use plastics around the world. The extraction of fracked gases in the US for plastic production also releases at least 1.5 million tons of leaked methane um, each year, which is equivalent to what is released by 500 average sized coal fired power plants. Methane is considered to be 25 times as toxic um, as, as carbon dioxide. So we'll go to the next slide. So this is talking about ethane uh, grass, gas cracker plants. This is where fracked grass is gas is cracked to produce the material, materials used to make plastics, releasing millions of tons of methane into the, into the air each year. I'd like to emphasize that currently two new cracker projects are nearing completion in Corpus Christi, Texas and in Beaver County, Pennsylvania. Three others are planned in Ohio, Louisiana and Texas. New and expanded capacity of more than a dozen existing plants could add an additional 40 million tons of greenhouse gases per year. And the next slide. So most plastic is littered or landfilled, but some of it is incinerated. Municipal waste incineration of plastics emits at least 15 million tons of greenhouse gases per year, putting the burnt Putting the burden of dealing with plastic waste onto municipal waste facilities is costly and is paid, with, paid for by our local taxes. Many climate activists and politicians have yet to make the connection between plastics and climate change. I hope as you are now aware, all phases of the plastic production industry contribute to climate change. And we'll go to the, my last slide. Recycling is a false solution for the ubiquitous and frankly, I think, terrifying issue of plastic pollution. The biggest lesson I learned from the story of plastic is that 50% of all plastic ever made was produced in the past 15 years. And that, as we have said earlier, less than 9% of plastic has ever been recycled. Most plastic products are not easily recycled. And when they are recycled, they actually are what's called downcycled and made into an inferior product. They aren't made into the same quality um, product like glass um, often is. 
nor is plastic biodegradable. It will never return to the earth as glass, paper, and metal will. Plastic just breaks down into microplastics and microfibers, which are a major health and environmental concern. And I know we'll hear more about that later. As long as fossil fuel subsidies exist, making products from virgin materials is cheaper and easier than recycling. When the plastic industry introduced the idea of recycling, it put the responsibility of dealing with plastic waste onto the individual. It was the consumer and the local municipalities responsibility to ensure plastic was properly disposed of, not the corporation's responsibility to limit production. We need to take the onus of the climate crisis off of the individual and put it where it belongs on the multinational corporations who are producing so much unmanageable toxic waste and urge our local state and federal representatives to pass meaningful regulations to reach a zero waste solution. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eileen, for sharing that. And um, I wanna again encourage folks, if you have questions for Eileen, feel free to drop them in the chat. We're going to kind of pull from the questions that, that you, um, you share with us and we'll include those in our Q&A at the end of today's session. Um, but again, thank you, Eileen, for, for sharing that. I'm going to um, take a minute to introduce our next speaker, um, who is Sasha Adkins. Uh, Sasha teaches environmental health at Loyola University Chicago's School of Environmental Sustainability and is the author of From Disposable Culture to Disposable People, The Un Unintended Consequences of Plastics. And I think I have a copy of your book within arm's reach, Sasha. Um, appreciate you, uh, you referencing that. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. Uh, I also really appreciate the opportunity to be here with um, my colleagues who we're all working on this together from different angles. And this is what gives me hope and expanding tonight with all the folks in the audience. So as was just eloquently explained, the question is not how do we increase recycling rates? How do we decrease instead the demand for the production of new plastics? And the environmental justice angle here of who are the workers involved in the production, distribution, and disposal of these plastics? What are their exposures? And how can they transition to safer livelihoods? What are the impacts on the fence line or frontline communities, both human and the rest of life on our planet? And ultimately, how do we move away from disposable culture? So many of you have probably heard that we eat the equivalent of a credit card worth of plastic every week. And that bottle fed babies are consuming more than 2000 times that amount, 2000 times, which is 2000 credit cards. It's ridiculous. We found plastics on the baby side of placentas. So this scientific article is coining the new term plasticenta. We're finding plastics in poop, human poop, wherever we're looking. And yet the question is being asked, is that really a problem? Are we sure that that's not good for us? So I'm here to tell you that yes, we know enough right now to say that this is harmful to human health. This is not only coming from the foods that we're eating, as originally we thought it was fish from the oceans that would be the source because the fish were ingesting the, the plastic marine debris. Now a study found that fish in an open market had more plastic from the air than they did from the oceans. Microplastics and nanoplastics are an emerging class of air pollution, worse indoors than outdoors. But studies have shown that the Pyrenees mountains have air that is contaminated with tiny plastic fibers. It's in our soil as well. And agriculture is now given this cutesy name, plasticulture. 
And this covers everything from sheets of polyethylene that are used to cover the ground instead of mulching to bits of post-consumer styrofoam intentionally mixed with plastics, I'm sorry, intentionally mixed with soil to aerate the soil. This is a job that earthworms could be doing, but um, we are introducing plastics into soil where we're growing our food. And I have seen some preliminary research at scientific conferences I've attended where it looks like those plastics in the soil can disrupt the signaling between the plant and the community in the root systems of that plant. So for example, bisphenol A is a synthetic estrogen and that is an endocrine disruptor in people and also in plants. So I'm really wanting to expand this conversation from looking in aquatic systems, marine systems, to looking inside people's bodies and looking in soil and looking in air and saying there is no place left on the planet where we do not find plastics from the Mariana Trench to the atmosphere. But nowhere is this plastic more concentrated than in the bodies of the workers who are making it. And this is an x-ray showing the hands of a worker who makes vinyl chloride, which is the building block of PVC plastics. And you see that there are bands. I hope you can see my cursor. There are black bands at the tips of the worker's fingers. And this is where the bones are desorbing. In other words, the bones are dissolving inside that worker's fingers. And what the experience would be like is as if you have frostbite. You feel numbness and tingling, nerve pain, a cold that you can't get rid of. And eventually these bands will grow and more of the bones in that worker's hand will be resorbed. Vinyl chloride is also known to cause angiosarcoma of the liver. I'm just choosing one monomer and a couple of the health impacts, but all plastics um, have the potential to adversely impact their workers. And some might be asking, don't we have regulations that protect our workers? Yes, and we could argue that those regulations are not protective enough for chronic impacts. Also accidents happen, spills happen. Sometimes personal protective equipment is ripped or faulty. Also much of the plastic that's being made, let's look specifically at vinyl chloride, is being produced in China where there are not as strict protections from what I'm seeing as there would be for workers domestically. And so some are saying, shouldn't we just switch to bio-based plastics? There's a difference between bio-based and biodegradable. Bio-based means that it's made from plants. And sometimes this is actually no better than, um, except perhaps for the carbon footprint, but in terms of toxicity, you can take corn or sugar cane and break it down into hydrogen and carbon and oxygen and produce exactly the same plastic that you would have made from natural gas feedstock. And so that plastic that you've constructed from food, which in my view should have gone to feed people who are hungry, not to produce packaging, uh, for example, but that's not gonna break down any differently than the, the fossil fuel-based plastic would. Biodegradable refers not to what the plastic is made of, but how it interacts in the environment. And California I know is um, getting stricter on claims that things are biodegradable and saying you can't actually say that unless it's true on a relevant time scale. Everything will eventually break down, but that's not a reason to keep producing plastics. So the study was done and published in Environment International that showed that bio-based plastics are not actually safer. Other work that I have seen showed that some 
quote, compostable plastics like um, PLA are actually more toxic to human health and the environment than their conventional counterparts. One of the reasons for this may be the additives. Plastics are maybe half by weight of monomer of the building blocks and the other half is additives, fillers, unreacted catalyst and accidental byproducts of the polymerization process. What you're seeing here in blue are just some examples of additives that are intentionally put into PVC, polyvinyl chloride. And I'd like you to notice that bisphenol A, the synthetic estrogen, which is a building block on its own for polycarbonate, can be added to PVC for other purposes as an antioxidant, as a flame retardant. Many of the chemicals that you'll see in this list, you'll recognize cadmium, lead, um, azo-based dyes known to be carcinogenic, triclosan, which is EPA has phased out of products because it is an endocrine disruptor and it also interferes with our wastewater treatment systems. Um, many of the things on this list are toxic. And so studies have been done on the building blocks of plastic and say, oh, only styrene, bisphenol A, and vinyl chloride are really worrisome. But the other plastics, the so-called safer plastics, may have additives in them that are just as harmful. And the tricky thing here is that this information is proprietary. It's a trade secret. You are not considered um, to have a right to know what additives are in the plastics that you use or that are packaging your foods, for example. And there were many examples that I shared with my class this morning of, of experiments that went awry, experiments on brain cells where the brain cells in the control group as well as the experimental group started to die. And it turned out that it was additives in the polypropylene plastic lab equipment that was killing brain cells. Anna Soto's research was showing that nonalphenols, um, a kind of alkylphenol was used as an additive in polystyrene lab equipment and that it was causing breast cancer cells to proliferate, to grow as if they were in the presence of estrogen. And so we need to look at plastics holistically throughout their whole life cycle and not only the building blocks, the monomers, but also the additives. And another consideration is when plastics are in the environment, they are attracting other contaminants to themselves. This is a known property, which is why water filters often use plastic um, as a way of, of cleaning your water because it will attract other contaminants that dislike water and are attracted to fatty and oily substances. And so we've seen that plastics in the ocean can have up to a million times higher concentration of things like PCBs or DDE, a breakdown product of the pesticide DDT, or even polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which we have a lot of in Chicago. There are byproducts of the combustion of fossil fuels exhaust, for example, from our vehicles. Those levels of contaminants are up to a million times higher in the plastic than in the water itself. And so for all of these reasons, it's not too soon to say that plastics are a threat to human health and the environment. And with that, I will pass it on to our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. There is some startling information that you shared. And I think especially for those who may not be as familiar with the health impacts of plastic, um, it's really eye-opening uh, what you've shared and really helps us understand that plastic isn't just about an ocean um, issue, uh, but really helps to build this case that it impacts us in so many different ways. So thank you for, for that introduction and, and kind of diving into that. Um, I'm going to introduce our, our last expert here today, um, Chelsea Grassfield. Um, she's the policy manager at Friends of the Chicago River, which is a 42-year-old organization dedicated to protecting and enhancing the Chicago and Calumet River systems for people, plants, and wildlife. 
In her role, Chelsea engages with elected officials at all levels of government to educate and influence policies and legislation that benefit the river. Her policy work includes addressing water quality issues, chlorides, dissolved oxygen, nutrient pollution, et cetera, eliminating combined sewer overflows, um, advocating for nature-based solutions to climate change and reducing plastic pollution. Uh, so I'll hand it over to Chelsea, take it away. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. And these are some really tough acts to follow. Sasha, that was a very sobering presentation, but I really appreciate you getting the message out there. Um, so thank you to Seema and my fellow panelists. It's great to be here with you all. Jacqueline, my intro gave an intro to friends, but if you're not familiar with us, uh, we are the only organization fully dedicated to the Chicago River system. And we work to improve the river system for people, plants, and wildlife. We do that through three programs. And today I'm gonna to talk to you specifically about policy. One of the things that struck me in the, the, the video was when they talked about plastic and they started pulling out, like here's how much of it ends up being recycled or downcycled. And this, this statistic of 32% of plastic packaging ending up in our environment as litter was appalling, but also unfortunately not surprising given the work that I do. So Friends of the Chicago River, we're part of the Chicago and now Calumet River Litter Free Task Force. It's a partnership with Loyola University, Mars Rigby Foundation, REI, my colleague Jacqueline from SHED, and Waste Management. And as it implies the name, the, uh, we are working towards a litter free Chicago River. And to that end, Friends host uh, just like Shed does, we host cleanups on the water, so in canoes, and also on the banks of the river in parks. And we've asked volunteers to collect data about what it is that they're finding when they collect litter. And we analyze that, and we have found that overwhelmingly, plastics and styrofoam are the main material type, and the activity, the source of this uh, litter is predominantly food related. So people are finding plastic forks and styrofoam cups, for example. And what's really great about all this data is that it allows me and my work of related to policy to, to go to elected officials and say, we have the data, we have seen firsthand, we know what litter is predominantly made of and we need to address that. So in my last slide here, I'm gonna talk through some local, state, and federal level legislation going on. And I pulled this other quote from the film, which they were rapid fire going through towards the end, uh, different countries and states that have passed bag bans, uh, other legislation. And, and so I liked this, we've got to pass legislation because I know a lot of you on this call ask and wonder what it is that you can do to help. And this is just one avenue. So policy changes. Uh, in January of 2020, the Plastic Free Water Ordinance was introduced in the city of Chicago. It called for addressing things like single use plastics related to food items. So it targeted restaurants, banning styrofoam, or yeah, styrofoam, polystyrene. Uh, and if you were eating indoors, making sure that people are using reusable items, not plastic utensils. And of course that was January of 2020. So then the pandemic happened. Last spring, a, um, friends and Jacqueline and Sasha and Seema are, were part of a coalition called the Coalition for Plastic Reduction. We're probably by now about 30 organizations, nonprofits, educational institutions, museums that are coming together to address plastics. And so in the spring of this year, we regrouped on this ordinance, looking at it, how can we acknowledge the fact that restaurants were so hard hit during the pandemic so that we can adjust the ordinance where we can, but still make it a meaningfully impactful ordinance. Unfortunately, around the same time, a weaker ordinance was proposed, one that only consulted the restaurant industry and not the environmental groups. And so this was passed in September of 2021. At this point, the coalition were sort of regrouping and we have, we had already started to reach out to restaurants because as you can imagine, 
we do hear a pushback, you know, is this an extra burden, an extra cost? Uh, so um, we're reaching out to restaurants, restaurant associations, local chambers of commerce, and talking with folks that are already doing great work. A lot of restaurant owners acknowledge this problem and they want to be a part of the solution or they know that their customers want to. And so Shed's got their great Let's Shed Plastic program that helps restaurants get on board. And what the Coalition for Plastic Reduction would like to do is to see if those restaurants would be willing to then take the next step of advocating. So it can be as simple as just joining a list of restaurants that say, yes, we're on board with policy changes that directly impact us, the restaurant industry. Or restaurants may want to speak with elected officials and serve as case studies and say, we've made this change, it's totally possible. We're on board with, with legislation that curbs and eliminates plastic use. So that's where we're at with the city of Chicago. On the state level, we are, again, the Coalition for Plastic Reduction. We are, uh, have been talking with elected officials about a polystyrene ban. This was also about January, February of 2020 that this was first introduced. So again, regrouping. Uh, but we have a lot of, uh, at the state level, elected officials that are interested in this. And so we're meeting with them again, talking with them uh, to get them on board and hopefully get it to pass. And that's what we're doing now, but we're also keeping an eye on the future. Uh, we would like to do an omnibus bill that wraps a lot of different ways to eliminate plastic use into one omnibus bill. So for example, this could be uh, bottle bill, um, yeah, bottle bills and, uh, and like plastic bag bans, so things like that. And then at the federal level, the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act will go into effect January of next year. Very exciting. The bill phases out a variety of single use products, such as plastic utensils. Uh, it does a number of other things, but for the sake of time, I'll leave it at that. Uh, and then also at the federal level, Congressman Quigley, who is the congressman in our state of Illinois, introduced a, a bill banning single-use items in national parks on October 8th. So that will move to the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, where it will be amended before moving to a full vote by the House of Representatives. And simultaneously, that bill was introduced in the Senate. So that was a very high-level overview of some local, state, and federal legislation that's currently in the works. Um, I'm happy to talk more about it if folks are interested. I, I should say also, this is not an exhaustive list. So there may be other things like EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility, that's become, I'm hearing about that more and more. Uh, so there are other things that folks are doing out there uh, to address this issue. And with that, I thank you for your time. Thank you, Chelsea. And I just want to thank you our experts today for sharing um, a little, little bit of what is going on in their minds and in their worlds um, as we you know, expand our understanding about, um, about the plastic crisis. So thank you all. Um, before we jump into a, um, a q and A in the next 14, 15 minutes or so, um, I did just want to ask if there are any questions or input from, I know uh, Sasha has many students who have joined tonight um, also the assistant village manager uh, from Vernon Hills or represent or representative Bob Morgan's staff, Jessica Scott. I know we had some, some folks here. Um, and so if anybody is interested in, in uh, jumping in from those groups to either, uh, maybe we can bump your questions to the top or if you have any input to share, please, please uh, let us know. Um, but maybe I'll kind of put that out there and also, um, go into a little bit of a, a Q&A discussion here. Um, I have a couple starter questions, but again, for folks who have um, you know, questions for our experts while you've got them, please feel free to drop those in the chat and we can pull from those and make sure that um, we're, we're making the most of, of the folks that we have here. Um, so let me reference my list of questions. Um, <laughs> 
So one thing that I saw, and we, we kind of have a couple starter questions here, and this can go for either Eileen or Chelsea, but um, California just passed a law banning plastics from using a recycling symbol unless they are actually recyclable. So that little triangle with the arrows. Um, how do we do that in Illinois? And I wonder, um, like, is the strategy there that we're not just throwing that recycling symbol so that people just do what's called like wish cycling and put it in the recycling um, bin, even if it is not actually going to get recycled? So I'm wondering if um, if anybody has a response to that as far as, you know, should we consider doing something like that in Illinois? And how would we go about doing that? Well, Chelsea, I think you should take that since you live in Illinois and I'm in Massachusetts, but I do totally approve of getting rid of those chasing arrow symbols. They've just been confusing in a way of greenwashing people into thinking that pl all plastics are recyclable. So Chelsea, contribute what you want. Sure, thanks, Eileen. I would say it's really helpful when there's existing legislation. For example, LA also during the spring, summer, passed some really great restaurant focused single, uh, single use items bans. And we are looking at that and looking at what they did. So when there's existing legislation, it's really helpful to the rest of us. We can look to what they've done and use that same language. Um, but otherwise, I, I did, um, I'm not familiar with that specific piece and I'm not sure how we would do it here, but probably adopting some of that language. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'll just add, it's really good to learn from other people's mistakes too, because we had a really hard time with our bag ban that we passed here because we followed what another community had done and we ended up with these really thick plastic bags and eventually we had to say no plastic at all. And I think one good tip if you're working on a bag ban is sewn handles and that me usually um, means it's not going to be just a plastic bag. But one concern I have in Massachusetts is that we actually have over 144 communities out of 351 have passed bag bans and we still don't have a statewide bag ban, which is really frustrating. Something we have to keep prodding our legislators about. <laughs> Right. And to that end, I also knowing, as Chelsea referenced, there's this coalition in the Chicago area working towards plastic reduction. Um, so maybe question for either Chelsea or Sasha. For, um, for other people who are interested, how can they support the coalition's work or support policy change um, if that's something that interests them? Chelsea, could I let you handle that one? Absolutely, yes. The wonderful Sasha has, for very valid reasons, missed the last few meetings. So they are uh, just a little bit out of the loop. Uh, so, and I'm so sorry, someone was messaging me something really great in the chat. So uh, how can people support the work that we're doing with the coalition? That was the question. Yep. Yeah. So uh, one thing would be great and uh, that I'm referencing what happened in the chat is someone on the call tonight is a restaurant owner and would love to join us. And so they dropped their email in and I'm going to reach out to them. So uh, so it's things like that. If you are, a, if you know restaurants that are really great examples that we should be in touch with, we would love, love, love to hear from you. That's really how we've been getting a lot of our meetings is either people in the coalition are regular patrons, you know, because uh, restaurants are more likely to listen understandably from people that actually purchase their product or food. So uh, if you have connections in the restaurant industry, we'd love to hear them. And I should say too, even though I was talking about that for the Chicago region, it's, this coalition is made up of folks, not just from Chicago, but, but the region. Uh, and we want to engage people throughout the state. So keep that in mind as well. And then uh, contact your elected officials. When things come up, it's really important to let them know that you care about this, that. And I've been a policy specialist for about two and a half years. Before that, I was an elementary school teacher. I will admit it was really weird and uncomfortable to talk to an elected official. They seem like this high and I can't reach them, right? They're not, they're, we're not on the same level. But uh, they, we vote them in and they should want to do 
right by their constituents. Uh, and it can be, I mean, I see in my older person's news, weekly newsletter, he's got office hours, two hours uh, every week. And it was as easy as just saying, hey, I'd like to talk to you. And then we get on Zoom and we're chatting about things that I notice in the ward and care about and things like that. So don't be shy uh, to reach out to your elected officials. It's really important um, to engage with them. So sorry, I may have rambled. I'll stop there. <laughs> no, that was great. Thank you. And I'm seeing some great comments and questions. Um, and something that was referenced because we've been talking about the restaurant industry um, and Candace asked what kinds of alternatives are available to restaurants and grocery stores that have come to rely upon plastic packaging for their food products and how do they, they compare in, co in cost to plastic products? How can we help these vendors become soldiers in the plastic army? Um, and kind of maybe a little bit related, but Nicole was also asking if plastic garbage bags are considered single use. So I just want to clarify that Yes, uh, I, I would consider them as a single use item, although if you're, I don't know, trying to reduce your garbage, maybe you're using the same plastic bag for a while. Um, I wanted to maybe jump off of what Chelsea was sharing about restaurants. Um, they can you know, play a big role in being advocates for policy change and really helping to inform you know, what legislation can look like and making sure that um, you know, they may be meeting their needs, but also making sure that um, that they are working towards a more sustainable future for their their whole industry. Um, I'm also I'm going to drop in the chat. Um, we've referenced just a bit. Shed Aquarium has a program to support restaurants. Um, it's called Let's Shed Plastic, and any restaurant anywhere, but especially in the Chicagoland area, is is invited to join. It's for free, and all you have to do is. Uh, fill out a, an onboarding survey and make a public commitment to reducing your plastic use. Um, and we provide a number of resources and invitations to virtual events and hopefully next year starting with on-site or uh, in-person events as well. But something else that I saw from folks in the chat is that one of our main things with our Let's Shed Plastic restaurants, and we have about, about 165 of them so far, um, but we really are trying to push them towards reuse. With a lot of what Sasha was sharing, restaurants are kind of giving into this greenwashing, thinking that bioplastics are a better alternative and thinking, if I spend a little bit more money getting this compostable option, maybe that's gonna be better for the environment. Um, and really, just as, as Sasha had shared, there are still so many concerns um, and kind of emerging research that's really you know, showing us that they're not better for the environment, not better for our health. So we are trying to rally around reuse. Sasha also referenced a, a study um, by Upstream Solutions called Reuse Always Wins. I think that's what it was. And it really helps to lay the case for the health benefits, economic benefits and environmental benefits and, and others around reuse. So even though it may seem several steps down the line. Um, it's really something for us to hopefully keep rallying around and helping to create that vision of, of a reuse movement for, um, for our community. So anyway, I kind of took the, the mic there to jump in and answer a couple of the questions. Um, but if anybody else has anything in reaction to what I was saying, otherwise we can see if we have time for a couple more questions here. I'll just say, Jacqueline, that the reuse always wins that you mentioned. I, I noticed in the chat, I think, that someone was asking about the difference in price points for plastic versus reusable items. Those are not numbers that I just know, but I know that in that reuse always wins, they do the comparison of the price cost. So for that person that was interested in that, you could check that resource out. I also just wanna add that a lot of containers that are advertised as compostable, particularly fiberboard containers, are coated with a synthetic polymer that's a PFAS, a nonstick, like the Teflon chemicals. I really recommend a movie called The Devil We Know. There's another movie, the Hollywood version called Dark Waters that talks about the health impacts of these chemicals. But what's happening is that when those containers with these chemicals in them are composted, that transfers to the soil and some work shows that it's taken up by the food grown in that soil, including edible parts of kale and, and so forth. So a lot of um, composting groups are realizing that and now saying you can't compost the so-called compostable plastics or um, compostable food containers because they are contributing toxic chemicals. So 
there are truly compostable containers that don't have PFAS, but you've got to go out of your way at this point to look for them and make sure that they don't have either short or long chain PFAS in them. So greenwashing, it's just rampant and it's putting so much of a burden on the consumers who want to make a switch and, and not knowing what is truly safe and what is truly healthy for us and the planet. But just to echo that, um, reuse does always win. Stainless steel, glass, you can't go wrong with those options. Thank you, Sasha. And I know we just have a couple minutes here. So I actually have a question for Seema. And Seema, you may be the one kind of closing us out. So it's it's up to you. Maybe we can kind of use this as a closer. But um, I know that um, your group, this isn't, let's see, Go Green, Vernon Hills, and Lincolnshire has been involved with schools to reduce waste. Um, so I'm curious if you have anything to share um, about that experience and, and what kinds of strategies you used. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we worked with um, our schools in our district um, over the past couple of years in order to try to reduce their plastic waste. And one of the first things that we did at the school was we started a green team at the school um, and we brought in key stakeholders. So we asked the principal of the school as well as board members and environmental teachers to sit on the green team. Um, we looked at the waste, not just the plastic waste, but as well as the food waste that was happening in the lunchroom. And we, we devised a plan of how can we reduce the amount of waste going to landfill step by step. So one of the first things we did was we got rid of styrofoam trays. Um, and you can imagine that's 400 uh, styrofoam trays that are used every day, single day in the lunchroom. And that was as simple as picking up the phone and calling our food ven vendor and saying, we don't want them anymore, replace them with cardboard trays. Um, and so that was the, one of the first things we did. The, the next thing we did is we started looking at the plastic utensils and getting rid of that, that package that had a, a spoon and a fork and a knife and a, a little plastic straw all wrapped up in plastic for each and, each and every student, whether they wanted it or not. Um, we reduced it to a single spork. Um, we stopped offering plastic water bottles in the lunchroom. Um, and uh, we've taken a similar approach in trying to reduce the plastic waste now at one of our high schools as, as well in Vernon Hills High School. And it's amazing when we went through this process at the high school, we looked at the, at the food waste and the recycling bin um, and the landfill bin and our landfill bin was much more than the other two. And that's because all of the food packaging that cannot be recycled um, and it cannot be composted. Uh, so we're working with the vendors to see what, what kind of solution we can come up with that. But I think my point to that is that uh, we, need to, we need to start some way. We need to, to approach our schools and, and we need to take that initiative. Congrats for that work. Thank you for sharing. And um, Eileen also had uh, recommended a, a movie called Microplastic Madness, which really shows the power of um, of young people and driving solutions in their um, in their community. So definitely recommend um, trying to see Microplastic Madness. And they also invite um, organizations, community groups to host screenings. Um, so recommend checking that out. Um, thank you again to all of our speakers. I think I'm gonna transition it over to Andy to give um, some closing words. So thank you, everyone. Hi, I'm Andy Amen from Go Green Highland Park. We were one of the sponsors. Well, I think I'm gonna let my notes go because we've covered almost everything and who wants to hear that again? But, but I know that everybody has to have been enriched by the story of plastic and the dive deep discussion that we've had from these amazing panelists. We, we've gotten a wealth of information as well as tools for action. Um, and the, all of the sponsoring organizations, both Go Greens and the Highland Park Library are really appreciative of your time and expertise to bring such a, a wonderful evening with informational success and um, inspiration to affect some change individually and um, of course on a broader level. Um, 
it's good to close with some positives. And because this is certainly a weighty and extremely disturbing subject, but we have also heard about some good things we can do, and I am not going to repeat them. We have choices in the grocery stores. The shelves have both kinds of things. We can make, we always have that free option to uh, say, I'll buy it out of a bag. Um, not always, but, but those choices are there, and those little things do matter. Um, I would also like to say that we've had some really good legislation. We didn't mention CJA that Illinois recently passed, and that is a landmark piece of legislation that um, will give Bob Morgan a, a lot of credit. He was worked very hard on that, and we are looking forward to um, lots of good things coming from that that will benefit us all. And on the federal level, we mentioned the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act that um, our Congressman Brad Schneider was a co-sponsor. And what was not mentioned though, um, is that one of the things that that act will do is to switch the burden of financial responsibility from the consumer to the manufacturer who made the plastic. And I think that's worthy of knowing. Um, it costs a lot to clean it up. So uh, we have possibilities. I, I would also add now that you might we should think about what restaurants we um, support and let them know how important it is and to speak up all the time about these things because the consumer is the bottom line. And um, you know, if we don't buy the product, there really would be no reason to make it. And I think that's a good thing to remember every time you make a choice. Um, I'm gonna just let you have a final word from um, Glasgow that will keep you moving on your activeness in this, in this work. It is, a, it is climate inaction that will lead to people living more difficult and less prosperous lives. That is Michael Mann. And he wrote, among other things, I've just read um, The New Climate War, which I think dovetails very well with the story of plastic and how we get to these points. So um, all of us, thank you very much. We thank you all for our, our audience. We're so happy that you took the time in everybody's busy schedule and joined us tonight. Thank you all. Have a good night and uh, choose, choose reusables. So. I'm just going to wait for everybody to. You want to stop the recording, Seema?